Hello, in this video we're going to talk about acute compartment syndrome. This is an overview and introduction. In this specific video we're going to talk about the leg affected by acute compartment syndrome, but the same principles apply to any part of the body essentially. Before moving on, it is important to know that the muscle groups of the human limbs are divided into sections or compartments. And so compartment syndrome occurs when there's increased in pressure within a compartment which compromises circulation and function to the tissues within that area. Compartment syndrome can actually be acute, such as from trauma or chronic, which occurs in elite athletes. But we are mainly concentrating on acute compartment syndrome. And the common sites for acute compartment syndrome is the leg as well as the forearm. Here I am drawing the leg of a person. And on the right, we can see obviously an enlarged leg, which is meant to represent uh, compartment syndrome. Before going into acute compartment syndrome, let us talk about the compartments of the leg as an example. In reality, it can be any compartment, such as in the forearm or the thigh. We're just using a leg in this video, remember. So first, let us look at normal compartments uh, in a leg to get an idea. So here is a cross section of the leg. Here is the tibia bone in T and the fibula bone in F. These are the bones of the leg. Now the muscle compartments of the leg can be divided into four. We will not look at what the names of the muscles are within the compartments. We will mainly focus on the compartments themselves. Now the leg compartments include the posterior compartment, the lateral compartment, the anterior compartment, and another posterior compartment. This one is the deep posterior compartment, whereas the previous one was the superficial posterior compartment, which includes the soleus and the gastroc muscles. So in summary, the leg has four compartments, and in each compartment you have muscles that run through them. Within each compartment you also have neurovascular bundles, which includes the artery, the vein, and the nerve. Why is this? So that the muscles can be supplied by them. Each compartment has a thick fascia around it. But fascia also surrounds each individual muscle. Here is an example of a muscle with fascia around it. The muscle is made up of smaller units of muscle bundles, which are also surrounded by fascia. Each muscle bundle is made up of even smaller units called muscle fibers. These are the muscle cells. The muscle altogether is supplied by nerves, arteries, and veins that supply that area. In acute compartment syndrome, there is a build-up in pressure in one or more compartments of a particular limb, in this case the leg. Here is a diagrammatical representation of all the compartments in the leg uh, swelling up because of the increase in pressure. This increase in pressure that we see in compartment syndrome leads to compression of the neurovascular bundles, which further increases the pressure and also can lead to devastating consequences if not corrected. The pathophysiology behind compartment syndrome, to put it simply, here in blue is the vein that drains from the muscle and from the extremities. Here in red is the artery that supplies the muscle with oxygen, and here in yellow in the middle is the muscle itself, the compartment essentially. Many things can trigger acute compartment syndrome, but let us say for simplicity's sake there is direct damage to the muscle or arterial injury in the muscle. This will all cause some form of inflammatory process and reaction, which will eventually uh, cause fluid to shift into the muscles, causing compartment edema. This increases the pressure. When there is increase in pressure, eventually the arterial supply will be reduced to that area because blood cannot go through. And this will eventually lead to the death and necrosis of that area. When there is death of the cells, this further triggers an inflammatory reaction, causing further edema and further increasing compartment pressure. It's like a vicious cycle. What actually aggravates this whole process even more is when the increase in pressure in the muscle compartment actually inhibits 
the drainage of the veins from the distal extremities. Because the veins cannot drain properly, it just pools. The blood pools, causing further edema, and this can occur in the extremities as well as in the compartment. And all this will further increase pressure. The lymphatics will initially try to compensate by draining some of this fluid, but it is soon overwhelmed. And so with this buildup in pressure and inflammation process, we see the signs and symptoms of acute compartment syndrome, which includes mainly pain out of proportion to the apparent injury, paresthesia, and deep burning constant pain. What is more important is the clinical findings. History examination is very important for acute compartment syndrome. Examination involves looking at the six P's. The six P's include pulse. Pulse can be present even with acute compartment syndrome. Paresthesia is common. Pain is probably the most important initial finding. Pain can even be aggravated by passive stretching of the affected compartment. For example, if there is posterior compartment involvement, dorsiflexion will stretch the posterior compartment, aggravating the pain on the posterior compartment. Similarly, acute compartment syndrome occurring in the anterior leg compartment can be aggravated by plantar flexing, which stretches that compartment. Pala is the fourth P, and in compartment syndrome, pala is uncommon. What is more common is pink, because the limb still has some form of blood supply. The fifth P is pressure. Pressure includes pain when touching the affected limb. Also very important, patients with acute compartment syndrome is often described as feeling wood-like on palpation because of the increase in pressure. The final sixth P is paralysis, which is the latest finding. We briefly looked at the pathophysiology, the signs and symptoms, and clinical examination of acute compartment syndrome. Let us look at what can cause acute compartment syndrome. Some of these are also the risk factors. The etiology or cause of acute compartment syndrome include fractures, which make up the majority, 75% of cases, thermal burns, crush injury, penetrating injury. Non-traumatic causes of acute compartment syndrome are less common and include thrombosis, bleeding disorders, and vascular disease. Finally, illicit drug use, chronic use abuse, is also a cause because of the use of tourniquets or injury by needle puncture. Investigations include full blood count, creatinine kinase, which is raised because of the damage to the muscle cells. It is important to remember rhabdomyolysis in this case. Rhabdomyolysis is where you have injury or damage to muscle tissue. This leads to similar findings to acute compartment syndrome. Rhabdomyolysis also has elevated creatinine kinase. Rhabdomyolysis can lead to acute compartment syndrome because it is essentially muscle injury. In rhabdomyolysis, myoglobin is also increased in urine. And so another investigation for acute compartment syndrome sus sus suspicion is urine analysis using dipstick, which will show red blood cells, which correlates to the myoglobin in this case. Finally, a pressure measurement may be used, which is mainly done by surgeons to assess severity and the need to operate. The management of acute compartment syndrome is important. Always have a suspicion of acute compartment syndrome if someone presents with acute muscle pain with the background of a fracture. Immediate contact to a surgeon is necessary if acute compartment syndrome is suspected and the management will really depend on what the surgeon wants to do. It can be conservative if not too serious and is improving. It is important to hydrate and achieve urine output for adults greater than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour, plus minus urine alkalinization. The problem is that elevated C creatine kinase and myoglobin is actually toxic to the nephron, to the kidneys, and so you want to flush it out. Morphine is also important for pain relief, but the main form of treatment is surgery, which is a fasciotomy. And as the name suggests, it's essentially opening up the fascial layer. 
The main goal of fasciotomy is to decrease the pressure in that compartment that the fascia surrounds. For example, let's go back to the same scenario. The same image where we have all the compartments of the leg having increased pressure. A fasciotomy aims to make the least number of cuts to the body to decrease the compartment pressure. For the leg, therefore, the incisions are made on either side of the tibia, which will cover all four compartments and thus decrease pressure in all four compartments. Zooming in, by performing a fasciotomy, pressure is decreased in the compartment, which will allow proper flow of arteries and veins and nerves that were previously compressed. Finally, if the surgeon thinks the limb is not viable because it was detected too late, for example, and there is gangrene, then the limb amputation is performed.